How do we use that Z depth render pass in Photoshop to create a depth of field? Let's go ahead and talk about it. What is going on Pro EDU community? It's Dustin Volkema, and today we're talking about the Z depth render pass. It's one of my favorite passes to use. And so what we're going to be doing is discussing today how to create a depth of field in Photoshop using this render pass. Now we're also going to be having a small series here of videos that's going to be discussing the different ways that we can use that in our composite work in Photoshop. So let's go ahead and dive right in and take a look at how to create a depth of field. All right, here we are in Photoshop. I've got a composite that I've been starting to build. And at this point, I feel like I want to have a depth of field and really see what this would look like as I start to work with those different adjustments. Now, if we go ahead and take a look at our Z depth pass here, we'll see that we have black to white grayscale values with the darkest values being here in the foreground and then the brightest values being towards the background. And what this is doing is just giving a visual representation by value of the point of where your camera sits to the back of the scene. Now, as we start to take a look at this, we're going to want to prep this image for using the Z depth for a depth of field here in Photoshop. So the first thing we're going to do is make sure that we have our Z depth pass currently on, and this is going to be above all of our different layers here. Now, how I have this set up is all of my accessory passes, I call them, are in their own group. And this own group sits all the way up top of all of my other render layers and whatnot for my composite. So this accessory group has my material ID, my Z depth, my shading normal, anything that's more info channel based rather than a beauty layer for the compositing. Now with this Z depth pass active, we'll see in our channels panel here that we have the red, green, and blue channels here. Now this is not going to give us any other bit of information because it's all grayscale, but in order to prep this for using the Photoshop lens blur effect, we're going to have to create an alpha from one of these RGB layers. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and control or command, click the thumbnail of the red channel here. Now at the bottom, we'll head down to this save selection as alpha. So we'll go ahead and click this button here. And now we'll see that we have alpha one that has been created. So let's go ahead and rename this to Z depth. And this is going to be the channel that we're going to use. Now we can head back into the layers panel here, go ahead and turn that off. We can also go ahead and deselect. So control or command D. And what we're going to take a look at now is the things that we have in the scene that are effects that have been built in to really enhance the image but are not part of the 3D render. Now this primarily consists of this post-processing pass which is just the bloom and glare from the render side here. So we'll go ahead and turn that off and then I have a color layer here that was just used to paint a little bit more color around the sphere right on top of the smoke that is sitting underneath. Now, the reason why we're hiding some of these layers is because the Z depth pass does not contain the information of these layers that we're compositing on top of our image. And so for something like this smoke that's there, I want that primarily to be in focus anyway, right around the subject, which in this case would be the sphere. So I'm just going to hide that so that that Z depth pass information doesn't really start to work with that smoke because then you start to get these weird edges and the smoke looks a little bit funky town and we don't want any of that. Now I'm also hiding the bloom and glare from this and that's primarily happening so that really kind of the same thing as a smoke. I don't really want to force a depth of field on that pass that I may not actually want. So hiding some of these effects layers that you're putting into your composite is a good idea before you start to implement a depth of field. Okay, back to it here. Now, with all of these layers here that are going to be on top of the final composite, what I'm going to do is actually select the layer that's underneath here. Now, with this one, it's just a gradient fill. So what we'll go ahead and do here is, at this point with this layer selected, we'll go ahead and press Control or Command, Shift, and Alt or Option, and press E. 
Now what this is going to do is create a new layer. This is called a stamp visible. This is going to basically be a copied and merged version of all of the layers that are visible underneath. So what we can do here is now use this layer for creating the Z depth. Now it is important not to right click and convert this to a smart object because this effect that we're going to be using is destructive and it doesn't really work with smart objects. So go ahead and just keep this as its own layer. Now with this done, let's go ahead into our filter menu here. And at this point, we'll go to blur and blur. There we go. And we'll go to lens blur. Give that a moment to pop up. And now with lens blur up, we have a few different options here. And so what we're going to be looking at is creating a depth using the source of our Z depth channel that we have created. So now with this, what we can do is use this set focal point. We'll see here that if we hover our screen, we have this little crosshair icon right next to our primary cursor. So what we can do is actually select different areas in our scene that are going to be made the focal point using the information off of that Z depth pass. Now, what we can do to visualize this a little bit better is go ahead and increase our radius. And now at this point, we can go ahead and start to select the different areas of our scene. And you'll see that now we're getting our sphere or our primary subject that's being blurred. Now we can increase this a little bit further here. And this is just going to work with us or work for us the same way. So let's go ahead and select our sphere. Now on something like this, I was thinking to have a little bit more of a bokeh blur in the background. So this is actually working out quite well, even though the radius is pretty high here. Now, what we can do is start to adjust some of these other settings that most often I'm actually not too worried about. Uh, but what we can do is go ahead and take the blade curvature. And what this is going to do is just give us more around bokeh and Rotation is going to be the rotation of our bokeh that's being created. Specular highlights here, we can go ahead and bring this up. I don't think we're really going to have too much to worry about, but we can also work with a threshold if we did. So this is more about just creating the depth of field. You guys can play with some of these settings and your images that have the nice, we'll say fairy lights and things like that. So with this one here, uh, let's go ahead and just take our brightness back all the way down we can go ahead and introduce some noise to this image here. Um, obviously going to a value of 46 is quite a bit. However, we can still choose just like with our regular, regular noise, we can choose between uniform and Gaussian. So for me, I generally choose Gaussian and we can go ahead and start to bring this down to somewhat of a reasonable level. If we want to have this in our scene at this point, also go ahead and make this monochromatic so we're not getting color noise. This is something I actually usually do during the grading process, so I'm not too worried about that. Now, before we get out of here, let's go ahead and we can just drop this just a little bit more with our radius here so we can see some of the details. And we can go ahead and click OK. Now, that is the base of how to simply go in and create a depth of field using the Z-Depth Pass. Now, at this point here, this is where I would go ahead and I would start to turn on some of these other effects that were made to be a little bit more in focus. Now, there are certain areas as you start to get into this. And it doesn't look like it's really problematic here, but if you do have things in your scene that are very sharp with your post-processing or your bloom and glare layer, that you may want to blur this layer with something like the field blur and just certain areas so that it works out quite well for you. Now let's go ahead and actually kind of reverse this process and look at why I was maybe talking about not doing certain things uh, in a certain way. And the first example that we're going to look at is why you would do this whole process after your primary composite is done. So let's go ahead and delete layer one here, get back to our starting state. Now, if you're starting to work with things like the material ID, for example, 
and you're starting to create masks, this can be a problem if you do all of this after the fact, and that's because you'll start to introduce certain artifacts. So in my case here, since we don't need to do this all over again, we'll just control Z, bring our layer one up, and what we'll do is we'll go ahead and just select the columns here. Now, if we go ahead and zoom in, you'll see that with these marching ants, you can see how straight or how crisp some of these selection lines are, and this is going to cause a problem. So if we were to go ahead and create something like a curves adjustment layer, and we start to adjust this, this is the problem that we run into. Because now we have a depth of field at play, which is a blurred image against a sharp mask. So what you would do is just get all of these primary pieces of your composite done before implementing the depth of field. Now, with this one here, with the smoke, uh, let's go, go ahead and see if we can break this a little bit. So let's go ahead and delete layer one. And now at this point, we can, let's just go ahead and do this again. So control, shift, alt, and E, or command, option, shift, E, I think it's all the same thing, different keys. So we'll go ahead here with this layer one, and we can head up to our filter, click on lens blur here. And now we can immediately see, because that lens blur just, took the same effect that we just did. And it was good actually, it was quite harsh. So now we can see how this is working. Now, because our smoke was not included in our render or in that Z depth pass, what we're seeing here is part of the image that is sharp and then part of that smoke image that is being blurred towards the background. This can be really cool for some effects. In this case, not so much because that's not what we were looking for. So we'll go ahead and control Z that and get back to the initial state. Now, this is something that I don't do all the time in Photoshop. A lot of times in my personal work, I like to actually bake my depth of field into the renders. And there are times where that can cause issues with masking and making a little bit more difficult selections, just like it is here when we're working with the Z depth first and then we're trying to apply other masks on. Either way is a good way to do it. A lot of times if I'm doing client work, I'm going to be doing this more in Photoshop or in post-production as a whole, just because I have a little bit more control on the post side as to where my client wants that depth of field. If they want it a little bit more blurry, wherever that focal plane needs to be, I can place it in that area. Now, it's just starting to work through this. Just remember to go ahead and hide some of those layers that you don't want affected by that Z depth pass. And in our case here, this was primarily that smoke layer that we didn't really want pushed and in, in acting a little bit funky based on our focal plane and the way that that Z depth pass worked. Now, make sure to stay tuned for a few more videos that we have coming out on the Z depth pass. As I said before, it's one of my favorites that I use. And with that being said, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Never stop learning. I'll see you in the next video.